Good afternoon, and thank you for joining Endemic Extensions, the 2020 Senior Studio Art Exhibition. I'm Joanne Brasington in Marketing and Communications, your host and moderator. This event is supported by the Offices of Marketing and Communications and Information Technology Services. To practice social distancing, we are all participating from remote locations and workstations. Our panelists today are six studio art majors and minors, along with studio art faculty. The students will each have 10 minutes to present their work, then there will be an opportunity for questions at the end. If you have questions, please raise your hand. There's a way to do that on Zoom. I will use the chat, figure, the chat feature to queue up the chat. When I call on you, I will make you live so you can ask a question or offer congratulations. You may also use the Q&A feature if you want to remain anonymous and have someone ask a question for you. A recording of this event will be posted at walford.edu slash coronavirus under the town hall tab. Now, I'll turn things over to Assistant Professor of Studio Art, Jessica Scott Felder. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, for our very first virtual uh, artist talk and exhibition. Um, so first of all, nobody signed up, you know, to be a part of a pandemic or to do remote learning, but we are here still being vigilant and practicing our, our work and our, our passion, in this case, for art and creativity. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of background information, this is our first year of having a studio art major. Uh, this class is uh, made up of majors and minors that have been working in a course. It's a two semester course called Senior Studio. And in that class, the first half of the class, they focus on kind of getting their ideas together, thinking about materiality, uh, thinking about an intent. And by the second half, they have kind of resolved some of the obscurity and the uniqueness and the, the areas they're exploring and have honed in on something specific. So you are seeing work as a result of working for a full year. This is the first time that we've done this in addition to having the studio art major. So they've been working for a full year in Dupree Studios developing this body of work. So if you can, um, because I know for the most part everybody may be accessing this from a cell phone or from a uh, computer terminal. Uh, if you can pull up the Wofford website uh, in one of your windows, or you can follow along with us. Each student will uh, first introduce themselves, uh, state their location, because that's a unique thing, is to think about where they are physically uh, and being present now where they are. Um, and they're gonna give an uh, overall idea of some things in, that they're exploring. Uh, if you can mute your, um, if you're not talking, if you can mute your, um, your window, uh, that'll be great. Um, so, and as Joanne, thank you so much, Joanne. That was a great uh, introduction. Um, uh, if you can, just, if you want to write down your, your ideas um, or your questions and comments uh, and, you know, definitely put them in the chat box, that would be great. So first off, we are going to start with Micah Tiffin. Uh, Micah, you have your screen ready? Okay, you can unmute yourself too. Thank you. Micah, we can't hear you. I have to have a mic in. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. All Great. right. Can you hear me now? All right. So I'm Micah Tiffin. I'm from Greenville, South Carolina, and I have been investigating painting over the past year. And I've been looking at spaces that kind of give off an ambivalent emotion. Um, by ambivalent, I mean that you constantly fluctuate between one side or the other um, in the sense like, if you look at something, you can't tell if it's good or bad, if it's bright or dark, if it's um, funny or sad. And I'm interested in those spaces where things are in between. Um, and a lot of my, and so most of these, most of this work takes place in painting. Um, so over the course of the year, I worked on painting techniques and painting styles to develop my skills in that process. And I'd, I'd like to first talk about um, kind of the idea that started all of this. So. 
I was sitting in our um, lab uh, working at a computer and I had this idea pop in my mind of beds sort of descending into space. And I got up from my chair and I went and I drew it on the whiteboard in the class. And that composition I used in a painting and in a digital space because I was interested in its oddity and its kind of weirdness. Because you think about um, beds descending in space as being both hospitals and asylums and places where people sleep, places that are comfortable, and it kind of walks between those lines. So my piece Blue Asylum was what I first started this series with. Um, and at this time, I was thinking about sense deprivation, but that doesn't really come up in, the, in my paintings, but it's kind of the idea of when you're deprived of your senses, it can be scary and awkward, but also peaceful and tranquil. So I started with blue as I thought that um, those type of hues would convey that information. But as I continued painting, I moved a little bit away from that um, and started using similar objects that I thought would convey this emotion better. So, so Michael, can you do the share screen? Um, I don't know if, you, if you're ready to do that now. Um, let me see. All right, thank Did that you. Work? All right, lovely. So this is this is Blue Asylum, and this is sort of what I was talking about, this row of beds descending into space and this sort of creepy hand um, emerging from the darkness. Um, so but as I was saying, I moved a little bit away from this, and this was the second painting that I did in this series. And as you can see, I'm playing with light sources. So I'm thinking about where light's coming from, where the shadows would be, and I'm starting to put objects in that kind of throw off this narrative. But of course, this is an investigation of my own. So everything in this image isn't perfect, but I'm trying to get at an emotion. So of course, I have feet descend or um, entering the um, composition from the right side. And I have this flamingo kind of um, fighting back at it. Um, the inclusion of the flamingo, I feel like is a question that I might get. So I'm interested in flamingos because of their peculiar beauty. Um, they're such weird birds in the sense that um, the way they stand on one leg, the way they're postured, their differences in meaning, but also they're like rich, oranges and reds and pinks and um, other colors that are a part of their um, life. So I move, I use this flamingo in another composition and this is me um, playing with what a church or what a small church would communicate with, with a flamingo and a wheelbarrow. And then I move away from kind of what I was doing and I started making more impressionistic paintings where I'm trying to use quick um, light brush strokes and really wet paint to communicate a space. Um, this image I, my uncle actually took of our lake house. Um, when the tornadoes recently went through, a tree came through the porch of a, our lake house and um, took off part of the roof and wrecked the deck. And this was a picture of, it was kind of a haphazard picture, but it was a picture of the aftermath of that. And I thought that, of, again, for me, this is a personal space of ambivalence because it's a place that I um, would go to when I was growing up and that was happy for me and that there were um, nice moments here, but then the tree had come and destroyed it. And so it was this place of like mixed emotions that I was thinking about. Um, the, next, <laughs> the next painting is, I, I just titled Chin Strap in a Urinal because it's a chin strap in a urinal. Um, now I understand that the purple urinal do, isn't really um, obvious in this painting because urinals are typically white and it's kind of lost in the blue. But I was thinking about what art was at this time and thinking about Duchamp's fountain and what it would mean to put a penguin just standing in it in a blue background. So that's that explains the Duchamp signed his urinal mutt, so I, I signed my urinal mutt in um, collaboration with that. All right, so the next painting is a flamingo. So I still use this kind of a um, light brushwork, but this, this was an attempt for me to make something that my family and others would like. Um, a lot of my work got mixed reviews when I would show it to people and I, find, I wanted to do something that felt more realistic, a little more lighthearted. And I was playing with um, color a lot in this. So I started with um, kind of a Sienna underpainting 
and then moved into the blues of the background. And the the sky is made of orange with kind of rough um, pink brushwork over top. But I think that this is more of a lighthearted and something that many people could have in their home, which is a little bit um, different from some of the other work that's a little more dark. So this, this I titled Comforter because I like the purple comforters. But this is a work that I created in Professor Vlasova's class. And it was a process of building up a space that was both real and unreal and both digital and could be interpreted as physical. So you have these beds sitting in spaces uh, you see in asylum, but there's also this reflection in the wardrobe in the background and there's these windows, but they're not really windows. There's windows, they're more of purple portals where animals come in and out. And there are these myst like mystical hands emerging from different places. And this like meat-like, but also carpet and red background. And I was just creating a space that I thought um, was both dark, but also light and um, vibrant, so. And then the last one I'll talk about is tub. <laughs> and for me, um, a t wait, I don't, yeah, that's it. So for me, a tub is a place of isolation, right? You get in a tub and it's this moment where you're sort of deprived of senses because you sit in water, but the water's warm. And sometimes there's candles and you have a book, but other times there's a roach in the tub. And it's this place that navigates in between this um, weird sort of emotional affect that happens. And I try to use, um, try to blend the paint more together to create this space. So in total, um, this is the work that I've produced over the course of the year. And I'm happy with what I've learned in terms of painting and in terms of subject matter. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Micah. Um, so yes, as uh, Joanne said, we're probably just gonna ch uh, save our questions for uh, after everyone is presented. So just be sure to keep them nearby or to include them in the chat menu or raise your hands. Uh, so it will be, done in the order in which we receive them. So thank you so much for assisting with that, Joanne. So next up we have Emily. You're on mute. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi, so I'm Emily Pinto. Um, I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. That's where I am now. Um, I'm an art history major and a studio art minor, um, which I didn't come into college aiming to do. I came in as a biology major, as many of us do. <laughs> um, but it took me until my sophomore year to really realize that that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to actually pursue art seriously and study it. Um, so I eventually changed my major sophomore year and here I am now. So this year um, was interesting because I was in a class that we focused on making our own work instead of getting assignments and then creating work in that way. So this whole year was really a development for both me and my artistic career. So I had not had much um, experience in painting or even in portraiture, which is what my art is. And I can go ahead and screen share now. For this. Can you guys see my screen? Okay, cool. So this is my exhibition. I'm gonna start at the bottom here. Um, so when I first started these at the beginning of this whole school year, they weren't developed at all. I would not call them finished. Um, it was really, I was just experimenting with doing an eye or eyes, a nose and a mouth, nothing else around it. Just kind of experimenting with the feel of using weird colors to make a face. Um, and then I just, the semester I continued to develop my skills in painting and my use of color and just the subject of portraiture. 
as an art history major, I've studied a lot of history. Um, and a, one of the main subjects in history is portraiture. Um, it, as far as art history is concerned, I was never super interested in portraiture until about like post-impressionism time um, because the artist wasn't um, doing naturalistic portraits. It wasn't for propaganda purposes. Um, if you can call to mind Van Gogh's portraits, his portraits use a lot of color, more so than naturalism to express who the person he's portraying is. And I really connect with that in my portraits because I was really focused on using color in a cool way and a non-naturalistic way to represent the person that I was representing. So these four at the bottom here were some of my first, I would say successful works from my first semester this year. Um, I started to really figure out how I wanted to use color and how I wanted to portray the person's face. I really wanted it to be the main part of the painting, not much extra. And so these were a little, these are a little bit less refined, less finished. Um, they have a little bit less detail than my later pieces, but this is where I started out. So as we go into the rest of my exhibition, um, the things, my, I used color a lot heavier and I used a lot more color. I used more detail and especially in the eyes and the hair. I added necks and some of them have a little bit just of a plain background because I really wanted the face to be the main focus. So I started really making, my goal was to paint strangers and people I knew um, in a mixture. So I really started out this semester, this semester um, just doing strangers because it's easy to get a hold of pictures of strangers and paint them in your studio. But as the COVID-19 situation happened and we had to go home, it was a really good opportunity to start painting people I knew. And so, of course, I had my family at home. So this, if you can see the screen right here, it's my brother and my sister. So it was easy to find people to paint in person. But also, I started painting people I knew, just my friends, like, who are all over the country. So I thought that was going to be really difficult, but it turned out to be a really good experience because it was a way to connect with my friends. It was a way for me to give them direction on how to pose, how to use lighting on their face, how to take a picture of themselves. And they were really excited to do it too. So it was a really good way for them to be involved in my work and for me to involve them in my work, almost in a more intimate way because we were trying to be trying to interact more since we all had to leave school. And so that's what I did. Um, it, came, it turned out to be a lot better than I thought. It was a great experience interacting with my friends and everything. And I really enjoyed creating art. It was super weird to start creating art at home instead of my art studio. But overall, I think it's been a great year. And I hope you all enjoyed looking through our, all of our exhibitions. That's about it. Well, thank you, Emily. That was very informative. It's kind of nice to see it as a, as think about it within a timeline uh, prior to COVID and, and after, um, and during, I'm sorry, during COVID. So thank you for sharing that aspect of, the, of, your, of your timeline. All right, so next up we have Kara. Hi, uh, I'm Kara Porter. I'm in Holly Springs, North Carolina. This is where I grew up. Um, and so I am a computer science and studio art major. Um, I was a computer science major for the longest time, uh, but I decided that I had a passion for art and I needed to pursue that. Um, so that's how I ended up here uh, in the art program and, and I wouldn't change a thing. 
So um, let me go ahead and share my screen and talk from my work. Okay, so this series that I have created is a mixture of um, video and photography. When I started out this journey um, at the beginning of my senior year, I was working with paintings and, and drawing and, and stuff like that. I wasn't really a photographer, um, but I took a class with uh, Masha our, in digital photography and I really kind of hit my groove um, and I found what I felt really like comfortable in. And I also think for the subject matter that I am gonna be talking about, it was um, the best medium to use for it because it showed a realistic side to um, the work and, and it helped focus on form and contrast and shapes as opposed to maybe the talent or, or, or something like that that I would put into a painting. So um, my, series is called Impressions. And in, in these photos, I've taken um, food items and I've pressed them into my body. Uh, this is the photos that like are of the imprints that I left on my skin after doing so. So I have um, cheese it High, which is a little cheese it on the tongue. Um, supposed to look a little bit like an acid tablet or uh, a drug or something like that. Um, this is Oreos and Milk. It's a Oreo imprint on jugs is the joke there. And then this is a peanut butter jar lid. It pressed into my side. This is vanilla wafers pressed into my cheek and you can see some crumbs left over from the imprint. And then these are bottle caps. Um, I have a personal relationship with each of these items that I have pressed into my food, but I intentionally left out any context so that each person viewing them would um, have their own experience with them. And what you think of when you see an Oreo is not the same thing that I think of when I see an Oreo. Um, these are personal to me because I am speaking from a um, you know, personal experience, I wanted to showcase the experience that women my age and, and other people, men, go through when they deal with eating disorders, especially the restrictive type. Um, so that is what I'm exploring here, and I tried to avoid doing it in a cliche way, since it is a pretty well-explored topic in the art, by focusing on um, what I've been through and how it can affect the body in a psychological and um, physical way. And then I also did a video, um, which was an interview of some other women in my life who uh, also went through eating disorders like I did and um, maybe still are struggling with it. So it's kind of an interview film kind of thing. It's about four minutes long, so stick with me if you can't sit through long videos. <laughs> okay, I'm going to play it now. And Bill. Why, what's the matter, Bill? Just look at that plate. Aren't you feeling well, Bill? Aren't you hungry? What can be the matter? Hey, my name is Nathan Stotson, and I'm from South Carolina. I'm Ashley, and I am from Holly Springs, North Carolina. My name is Emma Reedy, and I'm from Stoppers Rest, South Carolina, so right outside of Greenville. It's like 45 minutes away. Probably ninth grade. I think probably around seventh grade. It was towards the end of seventh grade. I want to say I was in elementary school. I was a pretty big kid, so I got this idea in my mind that I was already so big that it didn't matter how big I got, no one was going to like me anyway. I started dating this guy. I got commented on like my weight. Someone told me like, oh, you look good because they thought I had lost weight. So I contributed, oh, like I need to lose more weight in order to look good. Mine was really weird actually. <laughs> it was the shape of my hand. Like the way it went a certain way. Like if I was like 
labeled something, like holding something, had to look a certain way. I would only like my stomach if it was like behind my belt. So if I was wearing pants on the belt, my stomach had to be like at least an inch further back from where the belt was at and my collar buttons. And like this guy, yeah, I always look at my toes in the shower to see if I can see them over anything. And if I feel like I've had a rough day with eating and my stomach's like bloated or whatever, like it grosses me out that I can't see my toes. And then your hands are on your waist to see how much. And then like, I would like touch the skin like on my side to see if like, there was like stuff right there. And so my family didn't know that I need. It's like, you don't want to think your child like had that problem and I think that that's just because I was pretty in the dark about it like I would eat in front of them I would eat normally in front of them and then I would have hated myself after eating it they said it was ridiculous <laughs> where I would have bounced it and called myself over the toilet like thinking about throwing it out I didn't think like that that's crazy that's not even true you know just kind of like the, the normal or resisting the urge to, but they were not like it. They probably still don't get it. Then everyone wanted to tell me like how skinny I was and how good I looked. That was kind of a trigger. It's like, oh, well, what I'm doing is working, so, um, and now people are starting to like me. Like, I thrived off of that validation from others, and I would think if people weren't giving me a lot of validation, and like recently, they like, oh, I must have gained a little bit of weight. Like, I need to lose a little bit more. So I would want people to, like, um, compliment me. Then I would manifest on that comment all day and be like, oh, my God. That person said I was so pain. The word skinny is a little, like, trigger, I think. And it took me more like a reinforcement to what I was doing. I'm not hungry is, like, a good excuse. How small porn size could I eat? Like, I wasn't giving myself the nutrition. I needed at that age, especially at that age. I knew it was wrong, but I didn't want to do anything about it. When I got into, went into freshman year of college, I was 105, which is the same as like when I was in eighth grade. Yeah, I would say it was like 105 to 110. Oh, maybe 75 is probably my mother's. Aren't you feeling well, Bill? Aren't you hungry? Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, that is uh, kind of meant to, and you know, showcase the experience that's almost universal that women in like who go through this have because although we all grew up in different situations we kind of had um you can see I mean their words paralleled and their like experiences paralleled so that was what um that was it was meant to elicit kind of the feelings that it it, it you have when you're going through something like that um and that's my work thank you Kara um, so yes, that video, if you would like to spend more time with it, um, because it's a time-based element, just know it is available on the website. Uh, great job in getting it up there. Uh, so next up, we have Bryant Davis. Hi. Can everyone, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. I'm Bryant Davis. Um, I'm from Monk's Corner, South Carolina which is where I'm living right now due to COVID. Um, I, well, let me share my screen while I'm talking. I originally came to Walford as a freshman in 2016 without any plans to pursue an artistic career or any personal endeavors of art making. It wasn't until about over halfway, <laughs> over halfway um, through my time at Walford that, wait, is it working? Is the screen share working when I go to the, 
Yes, yes, it is, Brian. Thank you. Okay, so you when I go there and I don't see myself, okay, sorry. Um, okay. It wasn't until about the starting before my junior year at Walford that I formed a focus on um, making art. And I was raised in an environment where I practically was like a shadow for interior decorating and all types of textiles and window treatments and draperies. And I also spent a lot of time making art as a child. It initially started when I took pottery and a 2D design class at Walford that jump-started my interest in taking art again. When I got into the 2D design class, I realized that a lot of the things that I leaned towards were very installation feeling, and they usually focused on the materials that I was using and how I could alter them to make them have an unexpected result and see an object that you normally wouldn't see in that way. Um, I first off started studying my childhood and looking into fabrics that were actually from my childhood. That was a huge turning point for me because once I discovered those fabrics that were like scraps from even draperies like in my parents' first home that I was brought home to from the hospital when I was born, those fabrics indicated which way I was going to go in the kind of fabrics that I would collect in a purposeful way. Um, you see here on the screen, uh, on the left-hand side, it's titled Patrick Court. That was the street that we lived on. Um, and it says Pinopolis Living Room. That would be the living room like of the first home we lived in. And these were the window treatments. And they were in a trunk at home. And so during my work, I had my mom ship me some stuff. And I ended up cutting up the window treatments that she sent me and started making molds out of them. I wanted to make household items, which is what got me towards plateware and bowls, like you see here. And then over to the right, you see a, um, a plaid with the green floral background. This is supposed to kind of allude to like a little bit feeling of outdoors, like picnic feeling, which is like also a part of my childhood and like a part of my like visual experiences as a young child, spent a lot of time like outside in the backyard doing yard work or just doing like a simple picnic. And then up here, this is when there's another pretty big turning point in my focus. These are titled old and, um, old and gaudy. And it's, they're, they're supposed to be a three part series where I used different plateware to, to make impressions, plaster on the back of the fabric that I collected. And then I ended up crunching the plaster that I originally wanted to eliminate and left it on there so that I could make it feel really old in like an antique way because I really, really enjoy antiquing. And that's what initially like inspired these works is that I wanted it to feel old. I, it wasn't before I created them, but after I made these that I almost felt like they had some type of like historical genre to them. I felt like they had some type of like older meaning that I wasn't sure what it was, but I felt like I saw it and I liked them because I feel like everyone can interpret whether there's a historical context or a personal past visual experience that you can relate to these items with. And then up here, we've got the crushed velvet overflow next to this one that's titled Picnic. And that one's Picnic is emphasized with the outdoor scenery because there's leaves imprinted in the plaster. If you can see that, it's really light in the photo. but I left the impressions of the bowl on the plaster itself to where you could see it and then the fabric covers the rest of it. And over to the left hand side, this is when I was starting to get interested in more retro dated fabrics that are a little bit more appealing to me in terms of my personal space. This is like a crushed velvet, which later you're going to see like how I ended up using that. And then here, I ended up doing a tree of the women that have influenced me in my life over here on the left-hand side. Each set of plates represent an important woman in my life that has had great influence on me. So you see the bottom right ones that are very light and paisley colored. That represents my younger sister, while the ones up in the top right corner with the yellow flower represent my grandmother. And then the other ones right across from those on the left-hand side represent my other grandmother. 
um, doing that project actually inspired my work going towards drawers and impressions of them. So that was another turning point because once I realized that I wanted to do something that alluded to past, but also present experiences and combine that visually, I decided to go into drawers because it, that way I can make an impression of something that is a part of my own private space and also incorporate items that make me think of other people and myself. So that's what you see in Not Careless Drawer Impression. It's titled that because the interior of it is not at all careless. It's not what you would expect to open up in someone's home, but it's like a perfectly rendered version of what I would want to see when I open a drawer that's aesthetically pleasing. And then over to the right, you see a, um, a dated floral print that I used. This, when I made this piece, I was thinking of like my grandmother's drawers that have old dated lining and how I could like represent those in like my own creation. And then I didn't know where I was going to go next at this point, this was a few months ago. And I knew that I wanted to stick with fabrics because I have such a good focus on textiles and the textures of them. And I ended up having an internship with a design shop in Greenville. And that really opened my eyes about how my materials definitely manipulate me through my environment. When my environment changes, my materials tend to change a little bit. And therefore, what I do with the materials also changes. And so I ended up getting really interested in chairs. And I wanted to continue with the flat surface things. I didn't want to build a real chair. I wanted to represent it in an artistic way. So I started doing some small renderings, like we see here, the mid-century modern, part one and two. This is actually wallpaper that's recycled from the shop I worked for. These are a type of vinyl that's like a faux wood that you would use on an accent wall or a desk. And I used them to cut out impressions of chairs that I had drawn and traced out of, some of them are traced and some of them are hand-drawn, where I, could make a 2D rendering of a three-dimensional object that gives you like a little bit of a distorted perspective because you see that if you were to stand at the wrong angle of these chairs, they would look really kind of bizarre. They wouldn't have the right angle that you would want to see them as we see them right here in the photos straight on. And then this ultimately led me to having these pieces. The blue chair actually came before some of these pieces and then I went back and forth and then ended up um, going back and altering the blue chair that's titled Velvet Perspective because it was definitely one of my mm, favorite pieces because it really draws attention to everything that I'm interested in, the textiles, the texture, because you can tell it's velvet. People are tempted to touch it, which they did when it was on the show in the art building. And then when I, um, jumping forward, when we got sent home for COVID, I didn't know what I was going to do but I should have known that it wouldn't be as hard as I had expected because my focus in all of my art making involves interior spaces and especially ones that are personal to me. And I wanted to make more chairs. So after making a bunch of that I didn't like out of materials that I didn't enjoy, I finally realized that I could do the same thing in a two dimensional form that I had done with my other chairs, but with no background and nothing to put it on except the carpet itself. So that's why you see over here on the right, not shag, the chair right here that is cut out of carpet samples of actually really expensive rugs that were no longer used. And some of them are samples, some of them are off of act an actual real rug that was kind of damaged and needed to be thrown out. So this was my way of being able to take my perspective and like twist it to where I could still make something that I considered successful even though I was in a limited environment and I couldn't just go out and connect, collect new fabrics or go buy them because I didn't want to go out in public with everything going on. So I think that the carpet chair really shows a really good final product of like where I was heading and how I can continue to head in new directions with these kind of mediums and show like different perspectives on how to make these three dimensional objects. And that's pretty much it. Well, thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. It's great to see all the the different types of materials and resources that you utilize to to create this work. Um, and just as a reminder, if you have any questions, please be sure to 
uh, write them in the chat section. Um, if you can't access it, but you would like to kind of be face to face, maybe just put something next to your question saying, uh, I would like to access in person or something if you can't access it. All right, so next up we have Adam Linder. Hi. So I'm Adam, I live in Spartanburg, I've been here forever. Um, so I decided to work with comics partly out of just aimlessness at the start of this class and also just because of my familiarity with them. So I was really interested in comics pretty much since I was a child. Um, I really liked horror comics specifically like Tales from the Crypt old like pre-code stuff which also got me into looking at comic book censorship from a young age which kind of had a big influence on me just because it kind of made me realize that like comics weren't specifically what I thought of them as a kid they could be kind of whatever they wanted to even stuff that people might have issues with so when thinking about that I um was interested very much in what both what the content of a comic could be, but also starting to think about the forms it could take because that tends to be as fluid as the content it can have. So in making this, I was largely thinking about the language of comics and I guess my understanding of that comes from reading them, studying them, and also kind of from art history because there's a surprising link to art history with comics. But um, the possibilities of putting them in a gallery space were predominantly what interested me because I knew whatever work I was going to make for this class was going to end up in a gallery. And I thought the idea of linking a comic to a gallery was interesting just because it's not traditionally what I think of when I think of gallery work, even though there are like pieces, like I said, that inspired me to move in this direction, like um, a like classical piece of art that inspired me was Trajan's column and also thinking of gallery pieces like William Hogarth and kind of sequential art. So they weren't entirely alien to galleries, but as far as like culturally I think of them, I tend to think of them as being a confined object, usually to a book. So I wanted to go back to kind of that um, expansion of being in a more open space and interacting bodily with the work. <clears throat> so what I ended up making was a large wall scroll and I'll have a picture of the actual size of it at the end. But I wanted to create something in a space that someone could interact with and kind of see how the language of comics as they traditionally work could be changed when you are also moving around and having to move in specific ways with the way the comic moves and what kind of effect that would have on the reader. So one of the first things I was thinking about was kind of this cultural rhythm that I've learned about over the years and this is a generalization but there tends to be more of an economical use of space and information in like American or Western comics whereas if you go to Japan there's a lot more like poetic moments or contemplative still moments which is part of what I was thinking about in this and kind of the effect that that has on it because having more slow contemplative moments also means there's less going on so a reader can move on a lot more quickly if they choose to but also having something that has more densely packed information while it gives the information to the reader a lot more quickly it also kind of requires you to be still which I found interesting that kind of inverse interaction between how quickly you give out information versus how long you are spending in front of the piece. So I wanted to see how that specifically affected the reader on each page, but also as the work in its entirety, how 
moving through it kind of affected your body and how I guess the rhythm of your movement and kind of being aware of how much time you were spending with certain parts more than others and how that could help you interact with a story. Also, getting down to this page, another element of bodily interaction I was really interested in is kind of how your specific movements help you understand what's going on in the story specifically. So in my artist statement, I called this empathetic context, I believe, by which I mean that like on a page like this where I have this like kind of snaking body of text bubbles kind of moving down a staircase, thinking about kind of the fact that our eyes are necessarily drawn to text bubbles for context, how kind of leading the reader around in a space like this could kind of change their awareness, like moving up and down of what this space is instead of just looking at it um, and kind of, I guess, help relate to the character and what's going on in a more complete way than would normally be accessible. And then moving on to this final page, I was also, much like I was thinking about with rhythm, I was also kind of thinking about the form of it in terms of musical structure and kind of like motifs I remember learning about and how like visual motifs crop up and things. And for this last page, I kind of wanted to create this conglomeration of things that had already happened in the comic and things that were going to happen moving forward because I'm not done with this yet. And I wanted to kind of explore what the repetition of imagery does, both in kind of what narrative it creates when you put these images together and you notice very closely to each other the similarities, but also going back to the bodily movement kind of in what ways I can use this repetition of imagery to lead a reader around a specific page. So, that was kind of what I was working with in this page. And then this last picture is just kind of my attempt to show the scale of this picture in all it ended up being almost 10 feet long at this point, though I'm planning on making it longer. And I'm also looking forward to kind of putting it in a physical space whenever that becomes a viable option again, because I really kind of want to see people interact with it. And I think that'll be really interesting. And I think that's it. Wow, it's great to see that picture to understand the scale of this of this piece. Yeah, it takes up like half my hallway. Oh. Well, thank you, Adam. All right, so next up we have Jonathan. So we're getting close to the question and answer section. Um, so yes, do you have any questions? If there's anything, oh, I'm one of those people that's like right up in the thing. Um, if you have any questions about uh, any of the works that you're seeing or just the art making uh, process in general, um, you know, be sure to, you know, include that in the question and answer section provided on the upper right hand side. So it's good to see those numbers going up and questions are getting answered. Next up, Jonathan. All right, hey y'all. Um, my name is Jonathan Hall. I live in Mebane, North Carolina, which is kind of in between Greensboro and Chapel Hill. Um, I'm an English major and a studio art minor at Wofford. Um, and I'll go ahead and share my screen and share some more information about us. Um, so can everybody see that screen? Yes. Um, so I have been drawing for my whole life. I, I always have this inclination to just to draw, um, whether it's faces of just cartoons that I make up or just random intricate des designs. I, I, I always will find myself doing this on, on classwork, on homework, on church bulletins, on anything I get my hands on. Um, so I came into college with, with this background and, I, and I'd taken some classes in high school and middle school. Um, but I wasn't able to get in a studio, studio art class until my junior year, which was 
kind of sad because I, I, I had wanted to explore um, early on just the op opportunities for art uh, in college, but I luckily did get in one. Uh, it was 2D design, uh, junior year, fall semester. Um, I declared a minor in studio art last spring and then decided to take the senior studio class, which was a great decision um, because it allowed me the space and time to just make as much stuff as possible. Um, always, I, I, I would just gravitate towards that studio or my room, wherever I just had my materials. Um, and that's what I always have done and always probably will do. Um, but um, I'm gonna go ahead and move my, my first piece. So if you've, if you've read my artist statement, um, I shouldn't even, yeah. You know that I've connected my work, um, which is largely non-objective and, and geometric, geometric abstraction based um, to, to jazz music particularly um, because of both my personal connection to that type of music. Um, as I was, I was born in New Orleans but never really lived there um, consciously. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and, and also because of the way um, that I often create my work is with music in the background and more often than not, it's going to be jazz just because of just the way I, this, it's just what I like. It's what I like and what it, um, it just is important to me in many ways. So this is my first piece I'm going to highlight here. Um, it's called Interplay. Um, and if you, and if you, if you know anything about jazz and a lot of my pieces take their names from um, uh, jazz tunes that I've come to like over the years also that had good uh, connections with my work, I thought. Um, but anyway, this piece was my first true breakthrough, I would say, and, and, and like more, first of all, adding color was a big step for me. I, I usually just draw with pencil or ink pen in black or, or single colors, but this was the first time where I really was able to expand beyond just that color um, and add more. Um, and it also shows some depth in the way that I've layered um, different designs atop each other here. And if y'all follow with me, I've got um, examples of how that piece changed. So this is what was the, my initial version. And this was from maybe a year ago. And I I'd had this ar laying around and was like, I, I, I like this, but it's not anything close to being finished for me. Um, so I just randomly decided last fall to add this on top of that after um, doing a little thin white wash of paint over top of that first layer, which led me to this. Um, and then you end up with this final product, which has uh, that, those, that, that final layer, which is connected um, by those black lines, which I'm, um, I'm proud of. And it was, like, like I said, a first a breakthrough in, a, in many ways. Um, the next piece I'll show is called Loodle Lot, which is another name of the tune. Um, and this, similar to Interplay, features um, more use of color. It's, there's no black or, or uh, any, anything I usually would use. Um, instead, it's two, um, two, two layers kind of um, playing in, within each other. Um, and the way that I would connect it back to jazz, which has happened retrospectively, I, I, I didn't notice, notice at the time what I was doing, um, but have since realized that, that in the same way that I've, I, I create a lot of these pieces, um, with different, uh, you could call them lines of melody or harmony, if you're calling it music terms. Um, in, them, in, the, in themselves, they are, are independent. Uh, if, if you were to take this apart and have a green layer and an orange layer, they would be good and, and worth something. But whenever they're together, whenever I've drawn this orange on top of the green, it's just a more complete and, and interesting work. Um, and I like the way that, it, that the colors interact. I like the way that you can see um, the darkness whenever the orange has overlapped the green. I think that's, I think that's an inter interesting effect that's happened um, with this one. Um, next, I'll show this one called A Little Busy. Um, this was the first time, this is from last fall. So this is the first time that not myself, but somebody else um, recognized a similarity between jazz and my and my work um, and similar to the other pieces that I've shown uh, there's just a lot of intricacy um, but it's also outlined by a framework 
that kind of holds it all in place. Um, so I, I would relate that back to just how how a jazz tune kind of can expand from, you know, because I when I when I created this, I started from from a spot. I don't remember where, but this is mostly a, a continuous line going across this 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 piece, um, the same way that a, a line of melody would go across a jazz piece, but it changes and and has different spots filling in, um, but it's all bound by this um, these these lines that kind of hold it together. Um, so this was another example of how that connects. Um, I have two more that I'm going to show. This one here is called the backbone. Um, I would consider this a breakthrough in the way I was um, moving into maybe using different materials to make my work. Um, as I've mentioned here in the in the notes, uh, this white part is white out as you would find in an office or, or at, on a desk. Um, and I've used it to highlight this black um, section, which you could call the backbone, if you will, of this piece, um, where it's, it's being kind of re revealed what's behind this really intricate, um, intricately you know, detailed part that I've highlighted with the white. And, uh, and once again, it, it, it really um, just shows that connection between the jazz that I was undoubtedly listening to while making this, um, and only after to, to realize what what I'd been doing as a result, whether consciously or not, it, it, the connection's there. Um, and one, one more note about just that connection. So, <laughs> I've if you know me, and if you don't know me, I'll tell you now that I am constantly looking for ways to kind of represent New Orleans, like wearing t-shirts or, or cheering for sports teams. I'm always trying to let people know where I'm from. I feel like it's a special connection. I feel like it's a special place with a unique you know, cultural tradition that is, is, I would say, unique to anywhere else in the world. Um, and so through the listening to jazz, I've been able to connect back. But now with connecting back my, my art to the jazz and I'm listening to while making it, the creating of the pieces in themselves is also um, representative of that of that homecoming of sorts that, that, I, that I can experience through the, their creations, um, which is cool, I think. And then my last piece I'll show here is called Complications. Um, I created this. This was the first, one of the first I created coming back home. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, home is a place just like anywhere else where I, I, I draw all the time. Anytime I'm not doing anything, I usually will revert to uh, my large pad of paper and some Sharpie markers or whatever I have on hand. Um, and I think that this also, like I said, just embodies that idea of both, of just multiple layers of, of, of art uh, and lines like, and shapes coming together to create a piece that together is more interesting and, and, and uh, just, I think, good to look at than one if it was just the black and white here or just the orange and the yellow. Um, and the reason I show this one as well is because you can't tell from this picture, but I'll show you another picture that um, shows this, is that this one I decided to cut out. So I've, I've broken out of this square rectangular boundary that I usually confine myself to with canvas or the paper. Um, and here you have a, a kind of a organic shape that um, just shows, um, I don't know, I, I think it's interesting how it kind of, um, juts out of a normal ovular, ovular shape to more of just these big jagged edges. Um, and it kind of highlights the edge more than it would in the normal way you would see it in, a, just in, in this online gallery format, at least. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. That's all I, that's all I got. All right. Okay, well, that's everybody. Uh, Thank you for providing that additional image to help us understand that circular element that really helps to uh, paint a, no pun intended, paint a better picture of that, that breaking out of the, the square, these uh, squares that we're in right now, like the Brady Bunch. So, all right, what's next? Questions, it was great to see those numbers as far as questions skyrocket after that request. Uh, thank you everybody for being engaging. 
and, and you know, asking great questions. Uh, some were being answered via typing, which is great. I mean, those answers are great, you guys. Um, it's great to read those. I mean, and you're fast with the answers too. Uh, <laughs> it would take me a minute. Okay, so uh, let's see. Joanne, are you still on? I'm right here. All right, so can you take the lead on this end? I will, I will lead the questions. Okay, Thank this you. question is for Micah. How do your paintings relate to the installation pieces you exhibited earlier this year at Walford? Well, thank you for your question. Um, my installation pieces were sort of about security and childhood nostalgia, but they also had a similar um, theme of ambivalence a little bit. For example, in the fort was a back brace, um, which kind of contradicts with that um, whole idea of safety and security in a way, but also it, it supported it. But with this line of work, I was trying to move away from the senses initially. I was thinking about sense deprivation. And I was thinking about um, installation art and how installation art employs the senses to create space. And I was interested in doing the opposite. But I ended up getting closer to where I started um, as I went along. Um, I used paints to create these spaces um, that were... Com like complicated and they they have objects and items that contrast each other so i think i did i ended up getting closer to where i started than where i was trying to do the opposite of initially but um the work that i did that was digital and the asylum pieces were a lot darker um in terms of subject matter and they kind of employ um some objects that have um already created associations to shift your emotions. Okay, um, we have a question for Adam from President Sam Hat. Adam, how does the absence of color shape the engagement of the comic with physical space? Hi, thanks. So for me, it's kind of a matter of focus. Um, I mean, both in me making the work because color was just kind of an extra layer I felt would kind of take me away from just the focus on form that I was trying to take. But I also think in a space, it will create kind of a focus for the reader in like trying to keep them in that world as they're moving through it. So they can kind of, I guess, I guess separate themselves partially from the actual space they're moving through and kind of focus on the created space I've made for them to move through. Okay, um, Adam, this is for you as well. What inspired you to create a scroll? Um, I guess partially it was based in kind of history in like, I guess like both Japanese wall scrolls, but also kind of large sequential art pieces in history, kind of like hieroglyphics and pre-Columbian art. And it was also a matter of figuring out how exactly to create a comic for a space, especially with the amount of information I was planning on using. I feel like um, a bunch of separate pieces kind of would have been too much, especially considering how large it already is, trying to space them out. Okay, um, this is also for Adam. Adam, you are really popular right now. How do you think the storytelling of the sequential art will be affected or processed differently given the movement of the reader that you've helped open up? So I guess my hope was that it would kind of give you a better view into the world I was creating. Because, I mean, comic stories already give you kind of an emotional connection to the world you're reading about. But I was hoping that the inclusion of physical movement kind of mirroring that of the world you were reading about would give you like a whole new experience for the world in a way you don't normally get when sitting still and taking in a world. 
Okay, this uh, question is for Jonathan. This is from Colleen Balance. It's jazzy, yes, but there's so much more. Oh, this is a comment. Um, sorry, Jonathan, but Colleen Balance, I just want to say, has commented on lots of your pieces. She totally rocks here. I mean, she has had some good comments. So check the Q&A real quick for Colleen Balance. Um, okay, Jonathan, this is for you. Uh, do you start your art with a certain intention? If you'd asked me a, a couple months ago, I would have said, I'm just trying to make something that looks good, that I think looks pleasing to me, that I, I feel is uh, worth my time to look at. Um, I would still say that. I don't intentionally make things that I think look bad. Um, but I do, now that I'm more aware of my connection to the music, um, I, I intend to kind of, I don't know, just create a piece that seems um, to go somewhere to have some depth to it, not just to, to be a, a scribble on a page, uh, uh, some graffiti. Um, graffiti can be good. I, I've looked at doing some spray painting, um, but I'm just thinking, um, I, I intend just to make a piece that causes people to think about it more than just, oh, that looks nice. Not nowadays, that's, that's my thing. Um, but yeah, good question. All right, there's another question, and this one's probably gonna be better for, um, Jessica Scott Felder, is there a possibility that this art will be able to be displayed at Wofford once it's safe to return? Yes, there is a possibility. I mean, how many, how much square footage do we have in the building? I don't know. We'll find a space. So there, there's a possible, a really good possibility that this will be on view. Apparently we'll be coming back for graduation. So keep an eye out um, and be sure to follow our Instagram at Wofford Studio Art. Uh, we'll be posting updates and current work, great great work that's coming out of our, our current classes, which are now wrapping up because we're in finals, but we'll be posting updates there uh, as well as the daily announcements around that time. That's a great question. Who asked that question? Um, that was from the Hall family. Okay, okay. Uh, all right. <laughs> we have homegrown fans. Yay. Um, okay, uh, our provost, Mike Sosulski, is asking everyone, or not asking, but saying thank you to everyone for your creativity, intellectual curiosity, and visual brilliance, and I agree. This has been a wonderful presentation and a true delight to both see your excellent work and hear about your creative process. I cannot wait to see what each one of you does next. Congratulations. And on behalf of the marketing department, please let us know what you're doing next so we can publicize it because we're always proud to share good news of our graduates. Um, thank you. All right, this is for Jonathan Hall from Wilson Oswald. Did the quarantine and different style of life right now contribute to all of the inspiration of your final pieces? If so, how? That's a good question. I think, I think we all alluded to it at some points in our, our, our talks. Um, definitely the, 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 the change of going back home changed some things. Um, um, I would say some ways some others, others, our work is, is, would change more having gone home. But for me, I felt like I was just back in my happy place where I could spend more time doing, doing uh, just making art. Um, I did entitle the last one compl complications. It's kind of a some dark humor, I guess, towards the virus. I don't, I don't know how I feel about that. It's just, it's a complicated piece in itself. So I think I can stick with that. Um, but probably more than I know right now, I've been affected by it. But as myself right now, I would say that not much has changed. But if you ask me again in maybe a couple months, I might be able to pinpoint some, some differences that I've come across without even knowing, which I've done in the past as well. So that would be a question to ask me later. Um, Kara, how did you decide what food products to use for your impressions in your photos? Um, I uh, decided to use the, the, the food products that um, I chose partially because I needed ones that would actually leave a mark if I pressed it into myself. Um, my skin so like things that have ridges and, and actually with the, the peanut butter one I had to 3d print something so that I could actually um, 
get that to work. And then the other part of that is, uh, like I said, these are objects that I had a personal relationship with when I was going through um, that experience. And, and so they're stories that I have linked to me, but they're also ones that are very well recognizable, um, kind of in the term term of like consumerism and branding and, and everything like that. So um, that was also a like third part of it. Uh, Kara, this one's also for you. What made you want to break away from impressions of food to physical food with the cheese it image? Um, that's a good question. I, well, yeah, I guess, like I said, I, these are um, items of food that are from my memory from like cravings or, or something like that, that I went through or something that was during the healing process of, of the experience. So Cheez-Its were one that was really important to me. Um, so I just wanted to incorporate it in some way. And that's just kind of where my mind went when I was thinking about how to photograph that in interacting with my body. Okay, that's great. Um, we are going to go back. We've had a request that we go back and answer some of the questions that um, you guys have been, you've been Johnny on the spot and you've you know, typed in your own answers, which is great, but I think some other people want to hear these. So, um, Micah, this is from Dr. Goodchild. How do your paintings relate to the installation pieces? Oh, sorry, that was one we already answered. Um, um, okay, for, um, for William Davis uh, or Bryant, what is the scale of the final carpet chair? And how would you want to arrange four chairs in a gallery space? It seems that two chairs of vinyl face each other, sort of engaging with each other, but I wonder how you would arrange four of them and what will be your orient your intention? Um, I would say that if I were to do four of them, I would probably do them in like stacked columns where they were still sets of two, um, where they were, you know, a seating area for two people. And I would do them vertically to where each row had a seating area and then they go down in rows, but each row just has two. So it would be two. And then, you know, if it was four, it would be two rows and then two chairs in each row facing each other. And the um, dimensions on the carpet chairs, 21 and a half inches by 27 inches width. Okay, great. Um, Adam, is, um, uh, no, no, no. Sorry, my, my screen keeps scrolling on me. Um, Dr. Schmunk said, uh, this is also to Brian, he especially likes your final chair and the ideas of age and use that the carpets pieces suggest. Um, that was an interesting process to him. Can you explain that? Why um, you, yeah. The, what'd you say? Can you just explain that? I mean, why yeah, did you do sorry. that? Um, well, the, the carpet was originally something that I'd never even intended on doing, and I had had carpet samples I had carpet samples for over two months when we were sent home. And then I got home and was like, I kind of had like a narrow minded um, state of mind right when we got back. Cause I was like, what am I going to make? But really, like I was saying like earlier, it, it really is a good environment for me because so much of my stuff focuses on the materials in interior spaces. And so I already had the carpet samples. They were actually being used as like foot, um, I used them in my car in the trunk, even though I had a rubber mat on top of them because they were pretty. And I used them just to put stuff on top of like groceries in my trunk. And we went to the store one day when all this was starting and I was really stumped for what to make. And I was like, wait a minute, like I could make some type of rendering that's flat because I was already focused on two dimensional with the carpet. And I ended up using some carpet that was here at my house, like smaller ones that were no longer usable. And then also the samples that were actually samples of really nice rugs from the um, design shop that I worked for. So then I like cut them up after I drew it on a really large board and scaled it 
and then I cut them and then I placed them together so that it would make a different perspective. I originally had made some smaller ones that didn't turn out as good that were kind of fuzzy but that was also part of the process and added to just the feeling you know getting my hands on that carpet really directed me towards how I ended up making that final piece because it really did something for me when it was finished. Um, this question is for Emily from Dr. Schmont. How did you think about colors and your choices and combinations of them from an expressive point of view? How did you exaggerate shapes, especially facial contours with expression in mind? Hi, so um, I started out experimenting with colors just to kind of experiment how color works with the use of value in the face, um, just the way the light shines on it and showing light and dark using different colors. Um, after that, I tended to use really bright colors for people who are really upbeat and chipper in their attitudes. They're always a positive person. So that was very much like yellows, light pinks, and light oranges. Um, for people who are more, who maybe had something going on in their lives that was a bit hard, or they were just a more serious type of person, I tended to use colors like purple or darker reds um, to represent them. And I definitely did exaggerate shapes and parts of the face just to represent that person. I don't know if I could explain every single exaggeration. It was almost like I just felt it because of how that person was. I think I mentioned in my comments, um, the portrait of my brother, um, his face is definitely exaggerated, especially in his cheek because he is very, very mischievous and <laughs> it really just caught his um, essence, I thought. Thanks for that question. Emily, we have another one um, from Dr. Goodchild. Why did you decide to zoom in so tightly on the faces and the history of portraiture that is not the norm, perhaps? So, um, like I said in my talk, I didn't really like portraiture in the history of art until a lot later in time. Um, and a big reason is, first of all, the naturalism that tended to happen in past history I was not interested in doing and also just all the other things that cluttered a portrait, um, especially in like portraits of kings or queens. Um, so I really was interested in expression, most like mostly. So I really wanted to zoom in in the face and show every detail that I could with color and with just details, especially in like the eyes and things like that. Thank Emily. You. Uh, one more for you. You're, just, you're popular tonight. Your portraits use warm, cold colors to depict the energy a person is giving off at the time of the painting. Did you find that following COVID, the portrait skewed more towards sadness or seriousness? I actually expected them to. I thought they would, but it ended up not being that way because I guess people were happy to involve themselves in this project and I was really happy to have a subject and have a subject that I knew well and was happy with and of course many of the subjects being my friends I have a lot of good memories with them so I'm probably biased in seeing them in a happier light so actually it wasn't great um okay uh, Bryant uh, do you have a sense of what might come next with your art? And did Judy Chicago influence you? Um, I have seen Judy Chicago's work and I do like it. And what I was saying earlier is that, well, to Dr. Goodchild, I, what I've noticed is that maybe some subconscious decisions were made when I was like doing the final renderings, but I originally had already gone in this direction before I'd been like really exposed and like informed about her. Um, and in terms of the direction of where my art is going, as of right now, I feel like the material is starting to mean something different to me than it was when I started um, with this like focus on the interior space objects and then like the textures and textiles of those. I feel like those are starting to have some type of like societal meaning to me. And so 
if that's going to happen, then like my work might start to venture outside of an interior space within a home and maybe become more of like a public induced item that like feels like it's a little bit less private or something that brings about the textures in like the outside spaces that we experience. Also, this is for you, Brian. How do societal notions of gender play into your works? Well, I, I liked that question a lot because that question really reminds me of the fact that a lot of people, they might find it kind of unexpected that someone is producing these works that they're by a male artist. And a lot of times our culture, even in 2020, we've come a long way, but people still have been kind of preconditioned by society to expect certain items to be of feminine nature or have to do with the role of a female. And I feel like sometimes my works in terms of like the gender norms, they kind of twist it. Like it's kind of unexpected. Some of them, especially like the domestic items such as the bowls and the platters, those are especially like historically expected to be a female object within the domestic items of a home. While like my chair, like the blue velvet one, I don't really know why I was guided in that direction, but there's kind of a masculinity about it. If you look at the chair, it's not really a chair that you would see in like a woman's like private room or study to get away. It's something that you might would see like a father figure or a male sitting in because it's like a wing back and it, you know, it reclines. And there's like that classic ideal of like the recliner for the dad, things like that. And I'm not really sure like why I was guided in that direction because so much of my other art has been conditioned by my surroundings, which have been of a more feminine nature. So that's why you see more colors and more domestic items in the other stuff. Um, we have had so many people say nice things that um, I can't keep up with all of them, but just know that uh, the Wofford community seems really excited about your work. And thank you so much for, for presenting it tonight. I don't have any other open questions. Is there anything else um, anyone wants to add? I would like to real quick, just put a couple of thank yous out there to uh, President Sam Hatt and Provost Sosolsky for coming through and showing support. Uh, I would like to furthermore thank the Studio Art uh, faculty. There's a lot of work that went into this. There's a lot of work prior to this exhibition that happens. Masha Vlasova in New Media and Studio Art Practices, uh, Michael Webster in Sculpture. I mean, there, there's a lot of conversation that happens well before this. Uh, in regards to art history, Karen Goodchild, um, Dave Eford, uh, Peter Schmunk, we're sending hugs from afar. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for everything. It's Yumi Eford. I mean, there were exhibitions that uh, all of these students have been a part of, the juried student exhibition uh, that put, the, put a lot of uh, inspiration for them to continue their work. So again, you know, this isn't as a result of an overnight thing. There's a lot of time and energy that everybody is putting into to make this a great experience. So I want to put those thank yous out there uh, first before we move on. But if do you guys have anything you want to uh, mention real quick if you want to mention what what's next for you that was a great question that came up uh, if you want to talk about uh, keep it short because we're trying to keep everybody you know keep this down to an hour and a half um, you know I'll start playing music if you take too long like they do in the award ceremonies but yes so if there's anything else you want to add you know please feel free to do that Okay, if we don't have anything else, thank you again for participating. If you'd like to share this with someone who couldn't be here tonight, a recording is going to be posted at wofford.edu slash coronavirus under the town hall tab. This, in, this concludes our virtual exhibition, Stay Well Terriers. Bye everybody, good job.